you'll hear a variety of people speaking and you'll have to answer questions on what you hear. There'll be time for you to read the instructions and questions and you'll have a chance to check your work after each section. You should play the recording right through without stopping. The test is in four sections. Write all your answers on the listening question pages. At the end of the real IELTS test, you'll be given 10 minutes to transfer your answers from the question booklet to an answer sheet. You should be prepared to do this with the practice test. Now turn to... You will hear a man telephone a travel company to book a holiday. First, you have some time to look at questions 1 to 4. You will see that there is an example which has been done for you. On this occasion only, the conversation relating to this will be played first. Good afternoon. Italia Breaks. My name's Margaret. How can I help you? Hi. I'd like to book a short break in Italy. Hotel and flights combined. Anywhere in particular? Yes. Venice, if possible. The holiday destination is Venice. So... Venice has been written in the space. Now the test will begin. You should answer the questions as you listen, because you will not hear the recording a second time. Listen carefully and answer questions 1 to 4. Good afternoon. Italia Breaks. My name's Margaret. How can I help you? Hi. I'd like to book a short break in Italy. Hotel and flights combined. Anywhere in particular? Yes, Venice, if possible. We've been looking at some of your brochures, and I want to check if you have any special deals. Right. Let's have a look and see what we've got. Right. Mm. OK. I've got the screen up. Can you just give me a few personal details? Sure. First, can I just take your name, please, and a contact telephone number? Certainly. It's John Framlington. That's F-R-A-M-L-I-N-G-T-O-N. And I'll give you my mobile number. I can't always remember it. Yes, here it is. It's 07987 44192. That's it. And how many people is it for? Just two adults. OK. Any particular price range? It's our first wedding anniversary and we... Oh, congratulations! Thank you. So we wanted somewhere nice, but not too expensive. We would like to make it something to remember. Maybe in the medium price range. OK. How many nights do you plan to stay? Five nights only. That gives us plenty of time to do sightseeing and to relax. Right. That's five nights only. And what type of hotel? We initially thought of going for a five-star, but that might be too expensive. So we've been looking at four-star hotels. We've got quite a few in our brochure, but the one I would recommend is the Hotel Scotland. It's four-star, and I know there are rooms available because I have just made a booking for another client there. I didn't notice that one. I don't know how I didn't see it. It's easy to miss them. I've also stayed there myself, as we sometimes have to go and check out the hotels. And of all the ones I visited, this was my favourite. Oh, right. Before you hear the rest of the conversation, you have some time to look at questions 5 to 10.
Now listen and answer questions five to ten. What's the hotel like? It has a courtyard for breakfast. It's got fifty rooms. It's just been renovated, and so it's very stylish. Is it in the brochure? It's on page sixty-three. Ah, yes. I can see it's right next to the railway station. Hmm. But what appeals to me most of all is that the hotel's very convenient for all the water buses, and the idea of having a terrace with the room I really find very appealing. These are big pluses. It's probably the most central hotel we have. You might think it would be a bit noisy as it's in the main commuter area and a place where tourists go, but from experience, I can assure you the hotel is very quiet. Most of the rooms are facing away from the main thoroughfare. Can you tell me when you'd like to leave? The seventeenth of March, coming back on the twenty-second. Okay, I'll just check again if there are places available. Two adults sharing, Hotel Scotland. Yes, that's gone through. Okay, and how much is the break, including flights? There's a special rate at the moment because it's off season. For five nights, let's see. It's seven hundred and sixteen pounds for a double room and flights. That includes airport taxes, but not insurance. Each? No, for two adults sharing. That doesn't sound too bad at all. What reductions do you have at the moment? Well, if you make the booking before the seventeenth of February, you get a further fifteen percent reduction, subject to availability. That's a big saving. Yes, it makes the price very reasonable indeed. Do you need travel insurance? Yes, I suppose we better had. For seven-day cover for both of you, it's seventeen pounds eighty-eight. Okay. Do you want to book today? I think we should, but can I just check with my wife? Can you hold the booking for me? I can hold it until one p.m. Okay, that's fine. I'll get back to you immediately. I'll just give you a reference for the reservation. Okay. It's F A. P, S J M, one five. Thanks. I'll get back to you as soon as I can, and definitely before one p.m. This is too good an offer to miss. That is the end of section one. You now have half a minute to check your answers. Now turn to section two, on page one hundred and twenty-nine. Section two. You will hear a tour guide talking to a group of tourists who are visiting a historic town on the east coast of the USA. First, you have some time to look at questions eleven to seventeen, on page one hundred and twenty-nine. Now listen carefully, and answer questions eleven to seventeen. Right. So here we are in Fairhaven, and we have a couple of hours to spend in this historic center before we carry on to our motel. And as you'll know from the itinerary of our trip, we're visiting Fairhaven because of its historical links with a man called Manjiro Nakahama. So I'll begin by giving you a brief overview of his life, and then you can explore the town at your leisure. Well, Manjiro Nakahama, as he was then known, was born in 1827 in a village by the sea in what is now Toshishimazu in Japan. 
And like many people in that town, he became a fisherman when he was just a youngster. One day in 1841, when he was just 14 years old, he and some others were fishing far off the coast of Japan when they were caught in a storm and shipwrecked on a small deserted island. They had to wait for six months before they were rescued by an American whale ship that had stopped at the island by chance. Four of the five Japanese were put ashore in Hawaii, but Manjiro had become friends with a captain, William Whitfield, who came from the town of Fairhaven, where we are now, and he chose to remain aboard and to return with the boat to the USA. So Manjiro unwittingly became the first Japanese ever to set foot on American soil. He came back right here to Fairhaven with Whitfield and stayed with the Whitfield family, who paid for his education here in the town. He studied mathematics and geography, as well as shipbuilding and navigation. But he missed his mother and his own country, and eventually he went back to Japan, where he had a responsible position as a university teacher and also served an invaluable role as interpreter during the initiation of relations between Japan and the United States in the middle of the 19th century. But the most interesting thing is that the links between Toshishimizu and Fairhaven have remained and grown stronger over the years in spite of the distance between them. And in fact, the two places now have the official status of sister cities. Both places are ports, so in fact the inhabitants have a lot in common. There have been a number of visits by the inhabitants of Toshishimizu, in particular at the time of the festival, which is held every two years here in Fairhaven to celebrate the life and achievements of John Manjiro. It takes place in the fall, and there's an ever-growing program including drumming, singing, martial arts, and stalls selling Japanese and American food. So if you're going to be in the region around then, it's really worth a visit. Before you hear the rest of the talk, you have some time to look at questions 18 to 20 on page 129. Now listen and answer questions 18 to 20. Now many of the buildings that Manjiro Nakahama knew in Fairhaven are still standing today. And so if you'd just like to hand round some copies of this map, I'll suggest the best route to follow to see them. Okay, so if you look at the bottom of the map, you can see the Millicent Library. And that's where we are now. Now, to follow the John Manjiro Trail, you go out of here along Center Street and then head up Main Street until you get to Pilgrim Avenue. Go down there and turn right at the end. Go straight on, and just on the corner with Oxford Street, you'll see a two-story house. This is the Whitfield family house, and this is where Manjiro first stayed when he came to Fairhaven. It's still a private residence, so please respect the owner's privacy. Okay, now if you carry on along Oxford Street, then turn left at the end, you'll come to North Street, and about halfway down there is what's known as Old Oxford School. This was the very same school that Manjiro attended when he lived here. It was considered to be the best school in town because of the quality of the building. Unusually, it was built of stone, and the quality of the teaching. Nowadays, it's usually closed, except on special occasions. Go on to the end of North Street and turn the corner onto Adams Street. If you follow the road down, back towards the library, you go round a couple of sharp bends, and on the second of these, you can see the School of Navigation, which Manjiro also attended. And if you follow the road on, you'll soon find yourself back here at the library. And I'd suggest you spend some time looking around that, too, if you have any time left. Right. Now, 
Does anyone have any questions? That is the end of section two. You now have half a minute to check your answers. Now turn to section three. Section three. In this section, you are going to hear a conversation on animal protection. First, you have some time to look at questions twenty-one to twenty-five. Now listen to the tape and answer the questions. Thanks for joining us today, Mike. How did Baja California become a consideration for a condor release? Our recovery plan for California condors requires us to re-establish the birds in as much as their former range as possible. Baja, being the southernmost recent range for the California condor, works well in that they were only recently lost from the area. Mid 1930s, and considerable habitat still remains. It is very isolated, with very few people in the area. The mountains are spectacular, ranging up to 10,000 feet, or 3,000 meters. Our selected release site is at nearly 8,000 feet, 2,400 meters. Mike, how many birds do you envision flying free in this area, Baja, in the future? We will be releasing four to eight birds on a yearly basis, and will reconsider the situation when we have twenty birds in the area. What age do the birds have to be before moving them? That's a good question. Typically, we move them at eight months to eighteen months old. Birds are ready to fledge, or leave, from the nest at six to seven months of age. In our current release group in Baja, we have birds as old as thirty months. It will be interesting to see how they behave. I expect that they will want to range more than younger birds and make it challenging for us to keep up. Is there a maximum number of birds a certain area can support? Yes, it's called the carrying capacity for any area for any species. In our case, our strategy to find that number is to saturate the environment to a level where we determine that the birds are showing difficulty either in finding food, behaviorally, or in survivorship. That level is greatly determined by the availability of food in the area and nesting possibilities. Now look at questions twenty-six to thirty. As the talk continues, answer questions twenty-six to thirty. What do you hope to accomplish with this release in the long run? I expect that well within ten years the condors will be flying north and joining birds already released in Southern California. Hopefully, we will reach at least one hundred and fifty birds in each of these populations within about fifteen years. What would you say is the biggest contribution to the California condor program's success? That would have to be the fact that we were able to breed the birds in captivity from the 27 birds we started with in 1987 to the 205 birds we have today. This is thanks to cooperation between the San Diego Wild Animal Park, the Los Angeles Zoo, and the World Center for Birds of Prey in Bois, Idaho. Are there any problems keeping track of and protecting your released animals outside of the U.S.? Nope. We are using radio transmitters, and will be using the new satellite and GPS transmitters as well. Which system is better? Using satellites, the advantages over radio telemetry are numerous. It makes it possible to keep up with the bird's flight without being led miles in a matter of minutes. 
It took the young condor only a week to migrate across the state, and with just radio telemetry, poor weather can keep a plane grounded, and not all roads are accessible to track them on ground. New technology will allow one to be able to track birds that are not accessible by plane. Also, it is a new way to gauge the effectiveness of reintroduction. How so? If a condor transmitter works properly, researchers will get a location every 10 days for about two years. Do you see an end in sight for the need to breed condors in captivity? Yes, that would be great. But it will take a while for us to establish the two wild populations and make sure that they are sustainable. Part of our recovery is to maintain a captive flock of 150 birds in various zoos around the country as a safety net for the future. This is the end of section three. You now have half a minute to check your answers. Now turn to section four. Section four. In this section, you are going to hear a lecture on ecology. First, you have some time to look at questions 31 to 35. Now listen to the tape and answer the questions. Good afternoon. I'd like to turn it over to Dr Carey, who will talk about the program in restoration ecology. Thanks, Chris. A lot of people think that human beings can do whatever they want to the environment. But as Aldo Leopold taught, land is a system of interdependent parts which should be regarded as a community and not a commodity. Well, that idea has influenced what we teach here in our program, where students come from all over the world to learn about restoring native plant communities back into an ecologically natural state. This field is therefore a combination of formal science with practical applications, and that is quite attractive to many people. We have students, for example, from many different nations who come just to take part in this unique program. Our location is also quite unique. We have the world's oldest restored native plant community in Curtis Prairie at the Wisconsin Arboretum. Some say that this is proof that the science of restoration ecology was birthed in Wisconsin. Well, that may be oversimplified, but our reputation is strong. But students don't have to study prairies only. One student, Edmund Mukala, from the Congo, came to study restoring ancient wetlands in the Congo using knowledge gained from historic samples of the soil seed bank. Not all the seeds survived, but some can remain dormant for many years. Mr. Mukala wanted to find out what type of community would be most similar to that ancient seed bank. He has recently returned to the Congo and is now cooperating with the government to implement his findings. Now look at questions. 36 to 40. As the talk continues, answer questions 36 to 40. So the only prerequisite for doing research here is that it is a native plant community. That means not just prairies, but wetlands, woodlands, savannas, and other environments. We're proud of the diversity of research topics in our program. And we continue to grow. This year we have 32 new students from eight different countries. When students first arrive, they begin rigid coursework in statistics, ecology, plant identification, and the theory of landscape change. Then they take part in internships at local conservation agencies such as the Arboretum, 
the Nature Conservancy, the Parks Department, and others. We find internships to be crucial in helping students apply the knowledge they have gained in the classroom. And we're proud to say that, since the beginning, we have graduated 277 students with master degrees from our programs and 122 students with PhDs. Some have gone on to bigger and better things. One graduate is now the director of the Worldwide Fund for Nature in China. Another is the director of parks development in California. And others now lead their own research departments in universities around the world. This is the end of Section 4. You now have 30 seconds to check your answers. Music